Hello guys and you're welcome back. In our last lesson we had a brief introduction to Python classes. We saw what a class is and saw how we can instantiate and create classes using the Python programming language as an example. In this lesson what we're going to do is to look at a much more broader description so that we can understand what classes are and what objects are and then understand some of these specific keywords and how to properly create classes and objects and we'll look at a few examples as well. So this is going to be much more of a presentation and then in our next a lesson on Python classes, we're going to look at more hands-on practical examples. Object-oriented programming is part of uh, a programming paradigm that uses classes and objects and it tries to copy the real world. So let's look at a key presentation I prepared and then once we're done with that presentation, we'll actually look at just a very few examples. All right, so now that I've opened up my uh, slide, my PowerPoint slide, you can actually see an image of Doe. Right, so why do I have an image of Doe when we're talking about classes and objects in computer programming? Well, it's very simple. The reason is because object-oriented programming, which uses classes and objects, is a way computer programmers have created a technique to simulate the real world, but in a computer environment. If you think about it, you're getting all the data in a program from the real world. So why not have a system where you could create objects and things? In the real world, you can call anything a thing, right? Everything is a noun, it has a name. So even invisible things have a name. So that's the key idea. Now, if we look at Do, right? Do isn't really uh, consumed directly. You don't go to a restaurant and say you want a plate of dough. Dough is actually a raw material that is very powerful because you can use it to pre create things like, you know, bread, spaghetti, or donut. You can create a variety of pastry objects with dough. But dough itself isn't really a thing you would want to consume, right? So the idea is to have an object you could consume, you could sell. So when you have dough, which is a raw form, it is actually very powerful because it's from dough you can create other objects. So here we'll look at dough and then see things we created, we can create from dough, which are actually objects that exist in the real world. So for instance, you can have uh, donuts, you can have spaghetti, and you can have also uh, pastry. And I just explained that you can't really uh, consume dough. So the process of converting dough into a real object is through heating. Right, so you could use a variety of heating methods. You can use a oven baked, you could use a clean, you could use, use sand baked, you could cover it in a heating object. But whatever happens is this you need to convert your dough into an object. So your dough itself is called a class because it's a template, right? This is a template. And depending on how you change this template, you'd actually get an actual object from this template. So you just twist this around and you get bread. You twist this around, you get donuts. You twist this around, you add a little water, you add your salts or whatever it is you add, you add your yeast in some appropriate ratio, you will get an actual object. So dough is a template, it's a class, and then your pastry objects are the actual real thing you create from dough. That's a, a very basic layman definition of what objects and what classes are in programming. So let's move on with our slide. So like I said, when dough is finally processed into a consumable product, that is when you can, you can eat it, you can transport it, you can sell it, you can package it, and then the final product becomes a ready to eat on the spot commodity, right? So that's what the dough class is. Now let's look at a comparison between the dough, which is the raw uh, form, the template or the class, and then the processed dough, which has been created or a term in programming languages you called instantiated into a real object. So when you have a class, you have to instantiate that class to become a real object. Now I actually said right here that dough is raw, it is not consumable. So you cannot use dough in a production setting. You cannot actually have dough displayed as a product that's ready to be served in a restaurant's menu. 
right? So uh, processed dough, which is the product, is ready to eat. It's actually finished. You can order a donut with sprinkles and has honey on it and consume that. So you can use the uh, dough to create different pastry compositions. So you actually have that dough template and then the more water you add or the more flour you add or when you add milk or when you add salt in some specific ratio, it will actually become a finalized product right here like the bread or the donut. So again, dough has a specific texture, right? If you actually uh, kind of like look at this, it's actually much more solid, has less you know, water content. It has its own texture. But the texture of, say, for instance, bread or donut are actually uh, different. So for the color, dough can have its own color, right? But if you actually look at this, it has a default, you know, kind of like creamy white color. Right, so it's actually neutral. We can actually say it's neutral, but once you've actually processed dough to a product, you can actually see this is sort of like a, like golden brown. You can act like yellowish, light brown, sort of. So each object of the dough that has been created from dough can have its own specific texture. So uh, again, at the bottom, I said to convert dough to bread, you have to bake it. You have to instantiate that as well. So this is going to bring us to the introduction to objects and classes in Python. So how do these things come together hand in hand? You need one to be able to process the other one. So you need a class template to actually create or instantiate a real object. And a class in object-oriented programming, it will describe how you can actually create something. And an object is the actual thing that you've created based on following a class template. So that's the relationship between a class and an object. You have an object, you have a class that provides a template, and then you use the class template to create an object. You cannot have an object without a class, and you cannot have a class without an object. Right. So let's look at some key definitions here. Now, an object is created from a design instruction called classes. So it's been handed out to you on how to create an object. So a class will tell you how to do that. So the instruction provides the format needed to create something like, say, a variable, for instance. So you could, you could create an integer, a dictionary, or set, or any type of data in Python based on the predefined class templates. So again, an object is something that has, you know, its own set of unique properties and you know, an ability to do something. So if you look at a mobile phone, for instance, because a mobile phone is a modern common day object these days. So a mobile phone can have a color characteristics. So if you actually look at your own phone, it could actually be a black Android phone and your friend could have a white iOS device, right? So someone else could actually have a device that's red or blue. That's the characteristics. So objects have characteristics. While a, the phone itself can do something, you could browse with your phone, you could check your email with your phone, and you could actually, you know, call someone with your phone. Anytime you can do an action with an object, it's, that action is classified as its behavior. And anytime you have a characteristic of an object, that characteristic is the property of that object. For instance, people, uh, humans have a uh, you know, characteristics. Humans have a race class. You know, you could be white, you could be Hispanic, you could be Caucasian, you could be, you know, of an African descent or origin. So these are all ways to describe objects based on their characteristics and what they do. So again, I dive deeper, deeper into explaining what a class is. So a class is an instruction, rules, or descriptions or templates required to create an object. So for instance, if you're reading a cookbook and in that cookbook, they give you an instruction on how to prepare scrambled eggs. Basically in that cookbook, they tell you, you need two eggs. You need a cup of uh, half cup of milk. You need some flour. Okay, obviously I don't know how to prepare scrambled eggs, <laughs> but you need some sugar and you need a pinch of salt. If you read that cookbook for a million years without going to the market or going to your fridge, if you have those ingredients and bringing out those ingredients and preparing the scrambled eggs to eat it, you're never going to have scrambled eggs, right? So this, this cookbook that provides the step-by-step -step instruction 
is the class. That's the template. It's guiding you on how to prepare your cookbook. So, but when you actually go ahead in the physical world, get your eggs and prepare that um, scrambled eggs to the point that you can actually consume it yourself or give it someone to to give it someone to eat. At this point, you have now created a real object of that cookbook class. So you've actually instantiated that class and you have something real you can consume. Now, let's also look at how Python prepares a class or how Python tells an, a class that, oh, you actually have an object. Whenever you instantiate an object, Python has some built-in technique or method to check you know, what you need or whether you've satisfied the requirements that are required from a class template to instantiate that object. Remember, the instructions on how to create an object are built into the class. So if you use a couple of built-in methods in Python, it'll make you know cre creating templates or what, what is called constructors in a real object easier. One of the first things is a special method called the init method. This is called a double underscore method because it's created with double underscores. So these are two underscores. It's not a dash line. There are two underscores at the start, two underscores at the ending, and you have a opening and closing parentheses. This is a method. And remember in our lesson on functions and uh, functions in Python, a method can accept arguments, basically things you can pass to a method called parameters or arguments. So a very important argument that a function requires when you're creating an object in Python is the self parameter. Now, remember I said earlier that an object can actually have characteristics and behaviors. The keyword you pass into an init method will make the method self-aware when it has been created. So when you have an object, that you created an object and you pass an init method and you pass the keyword self, self is going to let the object know, hey, look, I've been created, I'm aware of myself and I'm ready to receive functions and behaviors, functions and properties that you can actually call. So basically, I'm aware of myself. That's why the keyword self is used and passed into an init method as the first default argument, which is going to be used by Python because it needs to prepare your object from a class template. So anytime you're writing a Python program and you see the keyword self being used in a function, note that someone is trying to use an object-oriented programming construct to tell Python to prepare the object based on the instructions that have been created in the class. And again, the self keyword is used to bind the properties, which are the characteristics of the object to its methods. So it's also common to see things like self dot this and self dot that to refer to a specific instance because an object is a clone, right? You can look at an object as an automatic clone of a template. The template is there to tell you how to create the object. And when you create one instance, you've created one object. You can create a million instances of a class template. And each of these instances need to be aware of who is who. So you use the self keyword to bind the object to a class so that each object will be self aware of itself. That is why we use the keyword self. Now you don't have to use the keyword self. You could use any word as your first argument you pass into an init method, but it's actually a good old tradition. And for clarity, anyone in the world who sees your program and sees you pass self, you'd actually see this. Now, really sorry about that, guys. This might look extremely abstract. We'll be carrying out hands-on practical examples so that you understand what we're doing. So let's move on. So this is how classes and objects work in Python. It's just a brief explanation. So when you create an instance, right? So, or when you create an object from a class in Python, it will look for the init method. And once it finds the init method and sees any objects you've specified in the init method, it will use that to instantiate the object properly. 
So the self keyword and your init function, they work hand in hand. And like I explained, whenever you see self in a function, it lets you know that the object is aware of itself. And the self keyword will make sure it binds an object to its functions and properties as well. This is also good when you want to borrow some other properties from other classes, which is part of object oriented programming paradigms. So let's move on. So these are examples of double underscore methods called Donda methods. Like I said again earlier, these are two underscores. So you need to create two underscores. It is not a uh, dash line like so. It's actually two underscores. The one we've actually been talking about is the init method, which makes things so much easier, especially when we want to set the default parameters that have been created in a class. You call this function when you're creating the instantiation, the object, Python is going to check the init method and see whether you are actually properly specifying how that class needs to be run. So the string method is going to be also used to properly format your output. So double underscore methods, super powerful. They actually help you overload, which simply means to change the behavior of something. Right, so we'll actually get into that again. So there are some other concepts about object oriented programming, not just in Python, but object oriented programming in general. So basically, the thing about these four programming paradigms is that, uh, for instance, you don't really know, need to know how a car engine fully works. You don't need to know the gear conversion ratio. You don't need to know the torque tolerance of your car. You don't need to know the chemical properties of the hydraulic system in your car engine to be able to drive a car. So that's the abstraction, right? All the technical and complex information has been hidden away from you and you just need the simple things that are exposed to you. For instance, you need to know how to use the steering, turn on the car, you need to know how to work the gears and press your brakes and clutch in case you're driving a manual car, right? So basically, if we look at uh, abstraction, which is one of the four pillars of object oriented programming, it actually um, shows you that. So what I'll quickly do is to head over and show you an example of how, you know, abstraction works so you can understand the first, you know, uh, uh, programming paradigm. So we're back here in Python and all I'll do is to quickly create a new file. So I'll go to new and I'll just call that uh, paradigm.py and we'll just save that as uh, I think I'll call that number uh, 20. So I'll do 20 on this call paradigm.py. So the first thing we'll look at is uh, let's say OOP paradigm And the first one is uh, abstraction. So in our abstraction, let me actually do something here. So I want to get the, uh, I want to create an algorithm that gets the length of characters in a string. So to do that, I'll create a variable called num and assign that to zero. And I'll use a for loop. And let me create something. Let me create an alt variable here with a name. So let's say name equals Peter, like so. So I'll create a variable called num, which is an integer to store a reference to the uh, number called num. And I'll use a for loop to iterate through this object. So I'll just say four items. I'll just say uh, characters in a variable called name. So what I want to do is to add one to num. So I'll say num plus equals to one, like so. And then finally, what I'm going to do is to actually print out the content. So I'll just say uh, there are, and I'll use a format specifier with D since this is a number, characters. I'll use escape key just to get rid of that highlighting in the string. And I'll use the format specifier to specify the string I have. 
So what I'll do right now is to pass in the format specifier and I'll add the first variable, which is the num, and then the second variable, which is name. So basically what I'm telling Python to do is to print out the number of characters that are in this string called Peter. So I'll save that and quickly run that. So it says there are five characters in the string Peter and there's a typographical error here. So I'll just fix that to A R E. Now this is these, these are the steps I actually used to get the number of characters that are in that uh, name called Peter. Now you actually saw how we did this, but Python has some built in methods that could do this automatically. And you didn't, don't need to see the step by step process in order to do this. For instance, if I wanted to just get the uh, length of characters in the name, I can use a built in function. I can just say print. So I'll use an F string this time around and I'll just say uh, length of characters in, uh, let me just, uh, I can pass in this, I'll just say in name is, and then within my parentheses, I'll pass in the len and I'll pass in the name like so, and I'll close my curly braces like so. So this second line here, I'll just say using a built in function. Now this is a built in method called len. We didn't create that. This was built into Python. So if I save this and run it right now, so we actually see that length of characters in Peter is five. So this is an example of abstraction because how Python is doing this has been hidden from us. We don't need to know how to actually uh, do this, but Python is actually going to do it. This is an example of how Python might have actually done it. It could take the name and then loop through the characters in the name, and then it could sum those characters and then print that result. So this is an example of uh, abstraction. So let's go ahead and jump back into our slide and continue working. All right, so when we're back in our slide, let's go ahead and move on because we've seen an example of the abstraction. So another part is uh, an encapsulation. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. So encapsulation allows you to build a program that is uh, sort of sandboxed. Basically, your program works in a specific isolated environment. You're doing that to protect your programs from unauthorized access and be specific. Basically, you don't want to create a program where other programs can have access and change things without giving the specific, you know, direct access. So you can see keywords like uh, public or private to actually hide those things. So encapsulation at the same time is, you know, having parts of a program working independently from each other and they can be allowed to communicate when the need arises. So you could have separate classes in different folders and then you only allow specific variables to be called from different uh, folders and that's actually done for uh, security so another oop paradigm is inheritance with inheritance you can actually do something that is called um, derivation basically you could borrow the characteristics of a class from another class without needing to write a fresh whole new class. Basically inheritance is trying to say, hey, you know what? If you actually live in the same house with you and you have a car and we're you know friends or we're very cool with each other and you're not using your car at that instance, I could actually use your car and you know uh, use it to maybe go to the store or whatever. But as long as you know I'm borrowing that car, I'll be using the same car you're using. So basically that's the concept, the layman definition of the concept of actually using a uh, class. So let's go ahead and see an example of a very brief example of inheritance. So we're back here in Python and what I'm going to do is to actually comment out this entire section so we don't actually have our code, you know, seeing results from our code in another section. So I'll just comment out this section using a multi-line comment. And I'll just say a number two, let's just add some real space here. 
and I'll get back up here. And number two, I'll say uh, inheritance. So we we're looking at an example of Python inheritance. So you can actually see what that means to in what it means to inherit from a class. So I'll create a class and I'll call that parent. And within that class, what I'll do is to use our init method. So I'll say uh, init. And in our init method, I'll pass in the keyword self. And I'll pass in another keyword called name. And I'll set the self.name to be equal to name. And I'll also create a single method in this class. So I'll just say def uh, print word. I will just print a simple word. And I'll use self so that when this object is being created, Python is going to look at the class and then instantiate that and bind it properly. So I'll do a printout, the self.name, just to print out the name of this uh, class. So let's create another class called son. And this time around, if I want the son to be able to derive from the init method and also the print word function, so what I'll do is to just pass in the name of the class I wanted to inherit from, which is the parent. Just by doing this, I don't need to create another init method, and I also don't need to create another function called print word. This is an empty class, so I'll just use the keyword pass. So let's create the instance. So creating an instance and making it go live. So first I'll create a variable called Vader and I'll pass in the keyword parent. And remember we said each time we create this class called parent, we'll pass in an initial argument called Darth Vader or any argument at all. So what I want to do is to actually print out the name. So I'll say Vader.name. And next, let's create an instance for our son. So I'll say uh, creating an instance for the son. So here I'll say Luke equals to the parent. And then I'll pass in that function. So I'll say Luke Skywalker, like so. And then I'll print out Luke dot name as well. So now we've actually done that. Let's save this and let's run it and have a brief explanation. So I have Darth Vader and have Luke Skywalker. Now the cool thing is I did not need to create again an init method and a print word. I'm actually using the init method and the print word method from the parent class, which is the uh, this one right here called parent and I'm inheriting. So let me just type this here and say inheriting the methods from the parent class. So basically you can have one class with hundreds of methods and whenever you have a new class and you need to borrow or use any function example for examples for example like the print word function we actually borrowed that and used that from the parent class within the child class so that's an example of inheritance so let's go back to our uh, slide and uh, move on so we've actually seen how we can use inheritance and how we actually overrode and borrowed a function called the uh, print word we actually use print word in our child class as well so let's uh, let me just maximize this for my presentation. I will slideshow and from current slide, so we can have a full screen experience. So another thing about OOP is uh, polymorphism. So basically, you have a uh, inherited class. For instance, if we have an example class like a circle class and a square class that have a function called area. So the area is going to be different from the circle class and then the square class. And the keyword here in polymorphism means changing an inherited behavior. So if you have a function in a parent class that calculates the area, when you have a child class that changes the way you should calculate that area, that's polymorphism. So let's actually see a very basic and brief example of how we could implement 
uh, polymorphism using uh, Python. So let's jump over to our Python uh, script. So what we're going to do is to also comment out inheritance. Oh, I'll just put that underneath this guy. So we could just do this and just pick this up like so and copy the whole thing and cut that out. And let's just drop this right here. And let's just paste this right here and let's drag this down and jump over here so we can actually see an example. So let's create a class or well, let's add a simple comment and say using polymorphism to exist in many forms. That's what polymorphism means. So let's have a class laptop, which is our main class. And I'll just call that laptops. Now you might not, you might, you don't even need to use this, right? But it's quite important that you do, but you, Python is not going to complain. So I'll just say has GPU. So basically this is a small program that checks if a laptop has a GPU built into it. So I just say, I'll just print out, uh, I'll just say uh, some laptops have a dedicated GPU, which is a graphics processing unit. So now this is our, uh, I'm going to use this as my parent class, which is my main class. So let's create a class for a friend's laptop. So I'll say friend's laptop, and then I'm going to inherit from laptop with an S. So this simply means any function that laptop has, I can also inherit from that. And more importantly, I can change how that function works. For instance, I could call and overwrite the same has GPU function. Now Python is trying to do a smart way of doing that, but I'll just exit that for now. We'll be looking at the super keyword in our lesson, but here I'll just say print and I'll actually say uh, no GPU present. So my friend's laptop does not have a GPU. And let's actually check another uh, example. So I'll say class teacher's laptop. Basically, I'm trying to check if the teacher's laptop has a GPU. And I'm also inheriting from laptops, which is our main parent class here, or our base class right here called laptops. And what I'm going to do is to actually copy, let's just copy the same has GPU method right here. And let's just paste that here. And let's just change this and morph this into, let's say has a GPU as well. So we have a parent class called laptops, which has a function called has GPU that returns an output to the screen. But well, here we're inheriting from laptops and we're using the function from the has GPU and changing how the output should be. So inheriting from a parent class and then changing that. So let's create our So let's create our instances here. So let's say an object underscore laptop is going to be equal to laptops like so. So that's how we can create an instance. So let's also create an instance of the teacher's laptop as well. So let's say object underscore teachers underscore laptop which is going to be equal to the teacher's laptop, right? So, and then finally, let's create an object for our friend and let's set that to the class name for friend's laptop, All right? So now that we have these instances, we can now have access to the functions. So let's say object underscore laptop dot has GPU and let's do an object underscore teachers laptop dot has GPU and let's finally call our object underscore friend laptop dot has GPU as well. So let's save this and let's run this program. 
and it actually you can actually see the three results. So this is from the base parent class. It says some laptops have a dedicated GPU. This uh, the teacher's laptop has a GPU as well, and then the friend's laptop says no GPU present. So this is just a bare bones example of polymorphism. So let's go ahead and jump back to our slide. All right. So now that we've seen an example of polymorphism, that's uh, that's going to bring us back to you know the ending of uh, a basic uh, description or definition. So as a uh, quick wrap up, Python objects and classes work hand in hand. There are special methods called the init method, the str methods, the file import or name methods that are called donda methods because they have double underscore and we use them to bind these to an object to make sure the object is fully functional in our third lesson we'll be looking at you know a few more practical examples of how you can take advantage of using object oriented programming if you want to be a very good software engineer you cannot escape using object oriented programming if you want to use other functions and methods or modules other people have built you cannot run away from object oriented programming if you want to do things like use a uh, library such as django you have to actually understand object oriented programming if you want to build games using a pygame library or the arcade library for game development you also have to understand object oriented programming object oriented programming is going to reduce the amount of code you write it's going to reduce errors because you're using modules that have been built by you know hundreds if not thousands of other developers and all you need to do is to inherit from their programs and then use them in your own program so it might actually look daunting and very confusing at first but trust me understand the keywords look at the examples have a printout of a few object oriented programming uh, examples look through them understand the keywords especially for python understand what the self keyword does how the self keyword can bind an object to its properties and behaviors and also understand how to create a class and how to inherit from the class and you'll be good to go on working with other uh, complex topics so once again thank you very much for watching if you like this content please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and i'll see you in the third part of creating classes and objects in python where we'll look at a few interesting and nice hands-on examples on how you can create programs using object-oriented programming.